Okay, thank you for sticking around and welcome if you're just showing up. This is the second half of tonight's forum. Um, we'll be going for about an hour. These are the candidates who have filed as Democrats in the uh, primary for the 11th District House of Representatives. This forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters Northwest Wayne County and the League of Women Voters Oakland area. This district, District 11, covers the communities of Plymouth, Canton, Livonia, and Northville in Wayne County, and many communities in Oakland County, including South Lyon, Waterford, Highland Township, Troy, Birmingham, and Bloomfield Hills. My name is Tara Moon. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters Oakland area. Your candidates tonight are there. I'm reading them not in the order that they are seated. Tim Grimal, Sunil Gupta, Feru Saad, Nancy Skinner, and Haley Stevens. They have drawn for the order that they are seated in, and we'll do uh, questions and their opening and closing statements in this order. Well, opening statements will go in this order, closing statements will go in reverse order. Uh, there are pages circulating throughout the audience tonight with index cards, so if you have a question to write down, please uh, raise your hand and somebody will come to you with a card and a pen. If you have a question ready to go, raise your hand with the card in the air and they will come and grab it from you. We ask that the audience remain silent throughout this presentation and throughout this forum, and we ask that the candidates answer the questions with your views only, no personal attacks, and do not name other candidates by name. Ready to go? Okay. Each candidate will be allowed one minute for an opening statement, one minute for a closing statement, and one minute for, to respond to each question. Um, some of the questions, we got multiple questions on the same topic, so we combine them and we'll extend the time a little bit, and I'll prompt you for that. Your timers are seated there in the front row, and they'll let you know when you have 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and when to stop. Um, I'll let you finish your thought if you're in the middle of a sentence, and then I'll cut you off after that. All right, so we will start with opening statements, and we're going to start with Ms. Haley Stevens. Well, thank you so much, and good evening, everyone. I'm Haley Stevens. I'm a candidate for U.S. Congress here in Michigan's 11th District. It is so nice to be with the League of Women Voters and with all of you this evening. I am a product of this district. I am standing before you here tonight as the former chief of staff on President Obama's U.S. auto rescue. That was the initiative responsible for saving General Motors and Chrysler and 200,000 Michigan jobs. We stood up for Michigan and everything we represent, and that's exactly what I want to do for all of you in Congress. And by the way, on that initiative, I was the only person from Michigan on the immediate team, and I was often the only woman. So I know what it means to, to stand up for Michigan and to stand up for the things that we care about, like not taxing, passing tax bills that are one big corporate giveaway, standing up to the NRA, and most importantly, standing up for your health care. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Ms. Nancy Skinner. Well, thank you and good evening, the League of Women Voters. I'd like to thank you for having this wonderful bipartisan event and my fellow candidates for all showing up here to express our opinions. And um, I want to especially thank my mother for coming. My mother's here. My father passed away two weeks ago. My mother's recovering from a broken hip, and here she is today to stand by me. So thank you, Mother. Uh, so I have run for Congress four times now which means I am either very persistent or completely insane. Uh, I think probably a little bit of both. But the reason I am running once again is 25 years ago after graduating from the University of Michigan, I am from Royal Oak, I grew up in Royal Oak, I started working on something called climate change and sustainable development 25 years ago. And, and so my first race I lost to a guy who had no chance of winning named Barack Obama. And what he said is why he kept running was he had something to accomplish. I have that same, same answer to my question, why are you doing this? I know that the solutions to climate change are the solutions to our economy, and that's why I'm here to help do them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. Mr. Tim Grimal. Thank you. 
Our country is at a crossroads. Trump is attacking long-standing American values. We saw yet another tragic example of that this past week with the separation of children from their families. In order to successfully stand up and fight against Trump, we need someone with a proven track record of successfully fighting for progressive values, standing up against Republicans on the right wing, and winning. I've spent my entire life here in Southeast Michigan, I've spent my entire adult life standing up and championing progressive values. I did it as a school board member, I did it as a county commissioner, and as a civil rights lawyer, and I've done it the past six years as a state representative, including four years as the House Democratic leader, during which time I successfully fought to increase the minimum wage and to expand Medicaid coverage to cover 650,000 Michiganders. We need proven leadership in Congress if we're going to tackle our most pressing problems like investing in infrastructure, <laughs> investing in education, and making sure we have sensible gun policies. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Mr. Grimal. Feru Saad. Good evening. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. Um, I have to start today by talking about the Supreme Court's decision to uphold Trump's really racist travel ban. Um, it proves that the courts are just not going to save us. It's this election, or it's nothing. And we need to send people to Washington who are ready to push back against this presidency and frankly bring it to an end. And we need to send people who have a proven track record of getting things done and fighting for progressive, progressive values. I've worked under President Barack Obama at the Department of Homeland Security. I know what it keeps what it takes to keep this country safe. I've worked on counterterrorism. I've also worked on disaster response like during the BP Gulf oil spill. And I came back a few years ago to work for Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan when he asked me to join his team as the first director of immigrant affairs, where we were not only resettling refugees, but working on economic development by expanding small businesses in the city. And it's, it's time to do this. It's time to go to Washington and, and send people who are ready to fight back and get things done. Thank you, Ms. Saad. Sunil Gupta. Thank you so much and good evening. I am running for Congress because I believe the best thing that I can do for my children and for your children and for this community that I grew up in is to help take this country back from Donald Trump. My mother was a refugee who got an education and uh, in 1967 became Ford Motor Company's first female engineer. Now I'm the father of two little girls, one of them's here right now, right in the back, my six-year-old, not paying attention. Um, <laughs> I am, though, committed to making sure that she grows up in a world that feels safe and empowering. That means that thoughts and prayers are not enough, that we need common sense gun legislation, and we need it now. That decisions about a woman's reproductive health are between her and her physician, and never by politicians and that women deserve equal pay for equal work. It also means we have to stop using taxpayer money to sweep bad behavior underneath the rug. That's why I became the first candidate running for Congress in the country to propose that any candidates running for Congress should have to disclose that they've been part of a sexual harassment lawsuit. Because how many times have we elected officials and then found out after the fact about their bad behavior? We will take this country back from Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. The first question will start with Ms. Stevens. When you are sworn in as a U.S. representative, you will take an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. Are you willing to work across the aisle to pass legislation that's good for the country, or will you focus on voting strictly along party lines? Thank you for that great question. And I'll tell you this, this is a, a question that comes up a lot on the campaign, which is, how are you going to work together? And when I was working in the Treasury Department on the auto rescue in a time of crisis, which, by the way, we're in the middle of another crisis, I found people to work with, and we came together. One of the things that people don't realize about the auto rescue is that many Bush appointees stayed on to work with the Obama administration appointees. We also worked with Congress and we worked with Congress in a bipartisan way. So when I think about our biggest challenges, I often deem our biggest challenges as our biggest opportunities, and our opportunities to come together. Collaboration is the way of the 21st century, and that will be a commitment that you will have in me as your next member of Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Ms. Skinner. Well. I want to address the reality 
the, the, the big pink elephant in the room. Donald Trump is destroying democracy, piece by piece by piece. We saw that today. We saw, we see what Donald Trump is doing where he'll, he'll, he'll selectively enforce some laws, but not when an overwhelming majority, <laughs> almost unanimous, wanted to put sanctions on Russia. Then he did not enforce that law. So there are good Republicans out there who are trying to stand up to them, to him. They wanted to pass a discharge position on this immigration bill. He would not let them. I want to work with the, with the bipartisan climate change caucus that's at 38 members now and grow it. Donald Trump has created a cult-like environment in the Republican Party, but not everyone is with him. Those people, I think, the moderates, we can all come to the table together and bring our democracy, keep our democracy, our institutions intact forever. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. Mr. Grimal. Not only am I willing to work in a bipartisan way, but I have a proven track record of actually having done so. I've served in the state legislature for the past six years. I'm the only candidate in this race who's ever held an elected office or ever served in a legislative environment. During my four years as House Democratic leader, House Minority Leader, uh, we, through collaboration and through some hard-nosed negotiating, got things done. We were able to reach the grand bargain, to lift Detroit out of bankruptcy and put it on a road to long-term recovery. We actually increased the minimum wage and indexed it to inflation for the first time in Michigan's history. We increased renewable, stand renewable energy standards and increased energy efficiency standards. And what I'm most proud of is that we expanded Medicaid coverage to cover 650,000 Michiganders who didn't have health insurance just four years ago. Those are important accomplishments in any legislative environment. I'm proud of the fact that we got it done in a Republican-dominated environment. I'm ready to hit the ground running on day one to do the same thing in Congress. Thank you, Mr. Grimal. Ms. Saad. Right now, Congress is missing people who understand relationship building and cons consensus building. And that's it, it's not just saying it, but it's all about understanding how to do it. When I worked as a legislative assistant at the, in the Michigan House of Representatives, I, I helped to help work. Uh, I worked to help pass legislation like banning texting while driving and foster care reform, which were both bipartisan pieces of legislation. Um, and that's the type of environment that I know how to work in, while at the end of the day never compromising on our values and understanding that. It's about what this district needs. There's lots of things that we agree on as both Republicans and Democrats, like investing in infrastructure, education, um, and, and our environment. And you can, you can use those as a catalyst to build relationships while not compromising on values like immigration, like protecting a woman's right to choose. And that's what we need to be strong on in understanding where we are in our values and where there's room for compromise. Thank you, Ms. Saad. Mr. Gupta. In my work as an entrepreneur in delivering health care to real patients, I was willing to work with anybody. It didn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican, as long as you're willing to solve problems. And here's the thing. When we're out there knocking on doors every day, day in and day out, not just knocking on the doors of Democrats, but independents and Republicans, and here's what I believe. I believe that we actually agree on a lot more than we give ourselves credit for. This fight, less and less, is about Democrats versus Republicans. And it's more about everyday people versus the special interests that are out there that want to make sure that the will of the people never becomes the rule of law. Most people agree that we need to be using the government's negotiating power to lower the price of prescription drugs. Most people agree that student loans are out of control. Most people, even gun owners, believe that we need common sense gun legislation. And again, special interests over and over again want to make sure that never happens. We have a lot more that we can agree on. We have a lot more common values. And that's exactly what I'm going to be fighting for. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. The next question will start with Ms. Skinner. Would you support legislation that would require super PACs and similar 501c3 corporations to name their donors in order to provide transparency for voters? Well, see, since I've been at this political game for a long time, I have been a long time advocate of public financing of elections. And because the reason is, when taxpayers fund the elections, taxpayers get served. When big corporations, through Citizens United and these other dark money uh, PACs, when they fund 
the elections, they get served. And we saw that in stark, in stark reality with a permanent uh, corporate tax cut, 43% of which goes to foreign investors, wealthy investors. So I think that, that we have to rethink this whole system. That is the major, if, 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 take any single issue there is. It comes down to these interests. I think they were mentioning waste, fraud, and abuse in the last panel, and all I could think of was Scott Pruitt. Look at how, how he is in the pocket of every dark money group and oil group that there is. And that is in working against the interests of the health and welfare of every human in, in, in American in this country. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. Mr. Grimal. Yes, absolutely. I, I have knocked on tens of thousands of doors over the years, and I have never met once a single, I have never once met a single voter anywhere who has said, you know what we need in politics? We need more money and less transparency. It's absurd. Uh, this, this is long overdue. We need more transparency in government in general. We need more transparency in politics. I absolutely believe that 527, super PACs, and other entities should be transparent and disclose their donors. I, I also want to emphasize that we need to go further than that. We need to overturn Citizens United. We need to have more robust public financing and have public financing for congressional races to incentivize candidates to forego uh, the special interest money and, and huge sums of fundraising and participate in public financing. We've got to wring this pernicious influence of money out of our political system once and for all. I have supported and co-sponsored many initiatives in the state legislature to do so, and I'll do the same in Congress. Thank you, Mr. Grimal. Ms. Saad. I not only believe that we need more transparency in uh, the super PACs and, and other organizations which are donating to candidates, but early on in my campaign I made a pledge not to accept any corporate campaign contributions. Because we, the, currently the way the system is, is you have a Congress that benefits from money and politics, and so it's never going to change. So until we start putting people in Congress who don't benefit from the system the way it exists, is that's the only way we're going to be able to see change and really begin to work towards campaign finance reform. And so we need to elect people who are also willing to take this pledge. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Saad. Mr. Gupta. I made a pledge early on. I wouldn't accept a dime from the NRA ever. I won't accept a dime from big oil companies ever. I won't accept a dime from corporate special interests ever. This campaign is fueled by people, and for the past two quarters, I've been the only Democrat in this race that's been able to outraise the Republicans in this race. We've been doing it purely by people. Here, here's the problem. The average household in Michigan has about $100 of disposable income. $100. And yet companies like Amway, Goldman Sachs, and Nestle can spend $100 million to influence our elections. When that happens, that is not a democracy. So yes, we need to overturn Citizens United. We need to, we need to gain that ground back. It's not going to be easy. We need to start now. It's going to take a political strategy. It's going to take a legal strategy. And yeah, it's going to take a getting a new president strategy. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Ms. Stevens. Make no mistake about it, the special interests have got to go and we've got to embrace public financing. I am in agreement with every single Democrat up here tonight. But I will tell you this, these campaigns seem long, they seem expensive, but what we all know in this room is that they mean something. And for me, when I got into this race in April of 2017, during some really dark times in the, the Trump administration, it meant something. A week and a half after I announced my campaign, that sea of all white men was standing right behind President Trump at the Rose Garden, celebrating their repeal of the ACA. But you know what we did? We banded together and we outraised Dave Trot, and we scared him out of this race. So there is power in people, and there is power in coming together through the grassroots, and that's what we need to support for the United States Congress as it pertains to our financing of our campaigns. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Ms. The next question, we'll start with Mr. Grimal. Do you support continual increases to our defense spending or should steps be taken to identify inefficiencies, wasteful spending, and obsolete programs in order to eliminate them and establish a more realistic defense budget? 
Obviously, we certainly need a, a strong military, and we need to make sure that we're adequately secure as a, as a country. But our greatest threats do not come from external forces. Our greatest threats come from within. They come from poverty. They come from malnourishment. They come from inequality. They come from uh, criminal justice uh, uh, irregularities that, that give injustice uh, to people in need. Those are our greatest threats. Those are what are, are real risks and, and threats to our fundamental country and our fundamental values. We need to make sure that we're adequately funding education, we're adequately funding physical infrastructure, that we're uh, adequately funding healthcare, that we're investing in people and in the potential of all Americans to succeed and achieve the American middle class dream. That will be my highest priority. Thank you, Mr. Grimal. Ms. Saad. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we really need better oversight and regulations of our defense budget, and that can absolutely be done without putting our military or our armed forces at risk. I mean, currently, the, the Republican Party, frankly, sees a investment in the defense as an, economic de as an economic investment tool because it goes to the contractors, it goes to funding, sending, selling helicopters to other countries. Um, and really, we need to be investing back into our economy here. Currently, we spend more on our defense budget than the next, I think, nine countries combined. And we spend more on defense in this country than we do on health care. There's a huge disparity there. We can better use this money, invest it back into the economy, and there's a way to do it without necessarily putting our country at risk. I worked at the Department of Homeland Security, worked to help protect our borders, and, it, it, and a lot of these, uh, in not investing in our economy, a lot of what the Trump administration is doing right now by separating families at the border is really making us less safe. Thank you, Ms. Saad. Mr. Gupta. We, we can keep our country safe, invest in our military, and invest in seniors, in children, in schools, in infrastructure. We, we can do both. The biggest narrative that we hear right now from people in Washington, D.C. is that we don't have the funding. We don't have the funding to take care of our seniors. We don't have the funding to take care of our schools. We don't have the funding to make good on our promises for Medicare and Social Security. But, but these same people, the same exact people, will sit and vote and lobby for a multi-trillion dollar tax break for the richest of the 1% and the largest of the corporations. I mean, here's, a, here's a question for the group. How much did Verizon pay last year in federal taxes? Zero. How much did Boeing pay last year in federal taxes? How much did General Electric pay last year in federal taxes? Right? These people are saying that they don't like handouts, and yet we just gave one of the biggest handouts in American history to the richest of the 1% and to the largest of the corporations. We can have both. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Ms. Stevens. I Make no mistake about it. I'm, I'm running for this seat as a woman in manufacturing, and I absolutely believe in government efficiency. I absolutely believe in a safe and secure military, but I also believe in fiscal responsibility. And what we need in government right now is we need to be investing in the innovation and the future genius of America. And one of the things that motivated me to run for this seat is because of some of the proposals coming from the Trump administration that we're gonna slash our research and development budget. You better believe technology is moving quickly. And we know that here in Michigan because we're leaders in autonomous vehicle technology. But if we are not prioritizing these investments from our federal government, it's gonna to go to China like that. So we need leaders, we need voices, and we need common sense. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Ms. Skinner. Well, I think we can all agree here in this room that we can sleep much better at night knowing now that we have a space force. <laughs> 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 President Trump today said that NOAA, the premier agency on uh, climate change, is no longer to focus on climate change. NASA is going back to the moon instead of focusing on climate change. And uh, the Pentagon has declared climate change and the impacts that we will see with, with migration, the Syrian refugee crisis was caused by a drought. That will continue to happen in, as the waters warm, we'll have food shortages and droughts. So, so it is a national security issue. Now one area where I want to increase um, spending is in quantum computing. 
The cyber warfare that's going on all across the country, I've been a big student of quantum computers for years. This is an unhackable system of, of transmitting information. Banks are doing it in, in Austria now on a trial basis. This is where the big money should go. This is how we will stop Russia and China from taking our infrastructure. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. Uh, for the next question, we'll start with Ms. Saad. And this is, we've had several questions about immigration, so I'm combining four questions, and we'll give a minute and a half for this one. Um, we'll start with Ms. Saad. And I can repeat these at any time for you guys. Uh, what will you do, wait, excuse me, how would you interact with the other side of the aisle to help solve the immigrant crisis? Do you support American tax dollars paying for a border wall? What is your position on DACA and zero tolerance, and what is your position on due process as it extends to illegal immigrants? When I was serving as Director of Immigrant Affairs for Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan, it was one of the most hostile times to work on immigration in this country. It was 2015 during the start of the Trump presidency. And we worked successfully on these issues in the city of Detroit because I worked with people all across the city and frankly all across the region, brought them into the conversation we talked about immigration as an economic revitalization tool, as the economic impact that immigrants have, and we were able to break down stereotypes and misconceptions to immigrants and refugees. During my time working for Mayor Mike Duggan, we increased participation in economic development programs by immigrant communities by at least 50%, and we resettled over 110 refugee families. I strongly believe that immigration is important to this country and it's what our country rests on. Separating families, period, and separating families at the border is just wrong and it does not make us more safe and the Trump administration is lying to you when they tell you that this is something that, that was caused by Democrats in the Obama administration. We need immigration reform that puts people on a pathway to citizenship and protects dreamers. And we, we need to be able to have allow refugees to, and asylum seekers to come into this country. Um, and it's a, a system that we have been doing for years and years and years, and they are one of the most vetted group of any immigrant group to come into this country. Thank so, you. Thank you, you Ms. Mr. Gupta. Yeah, I think one of the things you may have noticed if you were here before when the Republicans were up here is that uh, in no point uh, did family separation come up in their answers to this question? At no point. And we, we are living in a time where we know that there are Republicans out there that don't necessarily agree with Donald Trump, but they're not willing to stand up to him. And they're not willing to stand up to his, to his policies. We need more people in Congress that are willing to do this. This is emotional for me. Uh, I have my daughter here who's six years old. When she turns on the television, what she's seeing are kids that look like her stripped away from their parents. What's happening right now, what happened over the past couple of weeks has been inhumane and un-American. Now, there's no doubt that there are people, hard-working Americans at the border that are working security that need the resources they need in order to do their jobs well, and we need to make sure that they have that. But stripping people away, stripping kids away from their families, deporting and detaining contributing members of society, uh, these are teachers, these are first responders, these are nurses, uh, and, and rounding them up and deporting them is not the way to be, it is not who we are. Uh, people are not bargaining chips. And uh, finally, if Donald Trump wants a wall, I say we build him a wall right in between him and his Twitter account. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Ms. Stevens? My blood is boiling. What is happening at our border is unconscionable, and it is wrong, and it is a watershed moment for our country. We got to this place where we have seen family separation in America because for 20 years Congress hasn't passed common sense immigration reform. And now look at who we have in the White House. We have a reckless president who is putting forward policies that just are un-American and they're inhumane and they are wrong. So absolutely not. We do not need a wall. We do not need to spend taxpayer dollars building a wall. And what we do need 
if we need bold and courageous and real voices willing to stand up for what is right and to blow the whistle. Because we all know this to the Democrats in the room. If we hang out in the middle of the road, we're gonna get run right over. We need to call these things out. And you better believe I'm gonna be on that phone the first day in Congress reaching out to my colleagues, no matter what their party is saying, and say, now is the time for us to pass immigration reform. Now is the time for us to come together and call out what is happening around our country. Now is the time for all of us who are going to be going to the voting booth in November to say we are demanding something better than this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Ms. Skinner. <coughs> okay, so I'm a big picture person and you've got to realize where this, immigra this immigration crisis came from. Well, it was the president sitting with Steve Bannon and Stephen Miller with Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica on Facebook and Russian bots uh, testing what would motivate fear, fear, people that look different than us, different colors. That's how I'm going to win the election. There, Bloomberg had an article to out today that there is no immigration crisis demanding immediate action. In fact, the Mexican, the four-decade Mexican influx has actually now resided with over almost two million going backwards. The same problem with, with Central America is following that same path as they have less children and their economies improve. However, I'll go through and answer your questions. The other side, yes, of course I would. They had a bill that uh, was going to be voted on through discharge position, and uh, uh, Trump tweeted out, uh, forget it, just let's not do it. Um, the border wall, absolutely not. What a waste of money, they'll build it higher, unless it's a solar wall, and both sides can work on it and make money from it. <laughs> DACA, there are 800,000 people who are were far more vetted than the Trump administration, that's for sure. They have to have a job or be in school and constantly re-up their, their thing. The dreamers should stay here. It was not their fault. Uh, zero tolerance. That was contrived to uh, bring up Fox ratings news and take the attention off of anything else, all the other Russian investigations going on. Finally, due process. Due process is constitutional and it's also an international agreement that Donald Trump said we need to get rid of. It's unconstitutional. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. Mr. Grimal? Yeah, to answer the, the questions, uh, let me, let me first give you some uh, sense of where, where my values are on this. All four of my grandparents were immigrants here, and they came to America because they wanted to live in a country that was diverse, that was welcoming, and where anybody could succeed if they were willing to work hard and play by the rules. Uh, and Trump is standing all of those long-standing American values on their head. In terms of the, the question that was posed and the answer to those questions, number one, uh, yes, some additional border security is reasonable and sensible, but a sea to sea wall would be a colossal waste of resources, number one. Number two, when it comes to due process, uh, those who come here properly and seek asylum absolutely deserve due process to determine whether or not their asylum claims are legitimate and valid. Number three, dreamers did not come here because of any decision of their own. They should be allowed to stay here and be given a path to citizenship. And finally, what's going on with the separation of children from their families is outrageous. But I haven't just talked about it, I've done something about it. I got some of my legislative colleagues last week to join me in sending a letter to Governor Snyder pointing out that the children, the foster children here in Michigan and the agency that placed them with families are subject to state oversight and regulation and the state has an obligation to return them to their families immediately. Thank you, Mr. Grimal. The next question will start with Mr. Gupta. Aside from addressing mental health concerns, what new specific gun control measures would you support to help end the gun violence in America? So uh, I think that it is possible, despite what the NRA leadership will tell you, it is possible for us to honor the Second Amendment and pass common sense gun legislation. We can ban bump stocks. We can pass red flag laws, we can make sure universal background checks work and are everywhere, and we can make sure that weapons of war have no place in our communities, and we can still honor the Second Amendment. Here's the thing. When the Second Amendment was written, guns were not a technology. 
Today they are a technology, and increasingly the way they are purchased is through online technology. It should not be easier to buy a gun online than it is to buy a bottle of wine. But for a lot of people it is. That's because things are changing and the loopholes that we have are actually more online than ever before. I am a candidate in this race with a science and technology background, and I want to make sure that when we pass common sense gun legislation, it works for where we are and where we're going. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Ms. Stevens. I am looking to my day, forward to my day in Congress when I can be the NRA's worst nightmare. <laughs> I, we, we in this country need common sense gun safety legislation and we need it now. And we in Michigan know we can do both. We can say you can enjoy the sport of hunting and riflery, but that our children do not need to go to school afraid. That the assault rifles have had their day in this country. And that is why. On January 3rd of this year, I said, that marks a year to the day of the first day in Congress, in the 116th Congress. And on that day, I will be issuing a letter to every single one of my colleagues and dear colleagues saying, join me in passing common sense gun safety legislation, meaning this, universal background checks, reinstating the assault rifle ban, banning the bump stocks, no fly, no buy. We can get these things done. And when we flip the House of Representatives, it will be all the more real. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Ms. Skinner. Yeah, uh, the Second Amendment, uh, where does that lie? I mean, I've seen some on the extreme right that say, you know, everything and everything. Should we all be able to buy anti-missile um, uh, aircraft? <laughs> uh, machines of war and shoot down aircraft because of the Second Amendment is that absolute? No. What we're talking about is the difference between gun violence and school massive school shootings. A Harvard professor just wrote a book studying the assault weapon ban that was in place from 94 to 2004. What he found was that it didn't have much, much, much effect on gun violence, but was really effective in mass shootings, more than six people. So <coughs> therefore, since we've had 200 school shootings since then or more, that I would reinstate that assault weapons ban, bump the, ban the bump stocks, universal background checks. You're right, Haley, on that. Absolutely. These are the common sense things that we can do. Gun violence, I would take the Australian program of buying back guns voluntarily because people need money and get those guns off the street. We're not taking them away, but we'll buy them. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. Mr. Grimal. Republicans have been proffering the lie that Democrats want to take their guns for many, many decades. And it's long past time that we stood up and we said, it's a lie. Uh, we respect the Second Amendment. We respect people who are hunters. We respect people who want to have guns for self-defense. But we know that a large, large majority of Americans, including an overwhelming majority of gun owners, believe that we can have the Second Amendment and have common sense gun regulations too. No civilian needs an assault weapon, number one. Number two, we can have common sense basic policies that every other developed civilized country in the world already has. Things like universal background checks, things like red flag legislation to prevent people who are dangerous to themselves and others from obtaining guns, uh, banning uh, bump stocks, making sure that we're limiting clip size. These are common sense things that should not be controversial. In fact, they're not controversial. I've taken on the NRA and the legislature, and I'll do the same in Congress. Thank you, Mr. Grimal. Ms. Saad. Every time this issue comes up, one of the first things we feel the need to talk about is the Second Amendment. I'm tired of having this conversation on the NRA's agenda and on the Republicans' agenda. The debate isn't about the Second Amendment. It's about, really, people's right to life and our kids' right to go to school in a safe environment. And that's why we need a ban on assault weapons, why we need universal background checks, why we can increase the, the age of those who can uh, access a, a gun or rifle. And frankly, we need to change the conversation. Congress has banned the CDC from doing research on what is causing mass shootings in this country. So the NRA keeps telling us that it's the, it's the people, not the guns. But they won't allow us to go figure out what the cause is so we can get at the root of the problem. And this is where we need to start so we can begin to find solutions and work towards a lot of these reforms. 
This isn't a conversation about guns and people's right to have their own guns. This is a conversation about we have a public health epidemic in this country. Thank you, Ms. Saad. The next question will start with Ms. Stevens. What would you recommend to ensure that all Americans have affordable and accessible health care? That's the question of this campaign, and that is the question that our 116th Congress will be facing. And I will tell you this, I support the League of Women Voters and your proposal for Medicare for All. We need to get to a place where every single man, woman, and child has access to affordable health care. And how we do that is through legislation that, one, you know, we've had 10 years of a Republican Congress just about that has that is done what? They tried to repeal our health care at every turn without a plan to replace it, replace it. We need to tackle prescription drug costs. We need to change our patent laws. And we absolutely need to propose legislation to provide Medicare for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. <coughs> Ms. Skinner. OK, first of all, we should all know the premiums are going up now, this year, under Trump care. And that's because he repealed the mandate, okay, that provides the coverage for uh, pre-existing conditions. I am a finance major from the University of Michigan and studied a lot of economics. That's why the insurance industries had to have that mandate, so they could cover it. I also lost my thyroid, so I have, I'm one of those people with a pre-existing condition. Um, he also tried doing it by executive order in, you know, his, his new favorite, I hereby declare. So my answer to the solution, the problem of health care, has been the same one I had when I ran against Obama in 2004. Let the federal government compete with every level, employer-based insurance, every single one of them, using their buying power to bring down the outrageous cost of health care insurance and prescription drugs. What will happen when we allow them to unleash the huge power, buying power of the government is it will compete with these private insurers, people will move to the government, and we won't have to abolish all the, in, all the private insurance and health industry overnight, but gradually that will happen. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. Mr. Grimer. The Affordable Care Act uh, did a number of important things. In particular, it protects those with pre-existing conditions and it expanded Medicaid coverage. Uh, but we still have a long ways to go. Uh, we've got to make sure that in the short term, we're bolstering the health care exchanges uh, to make sure that they're more affordable so that healthy people don't opt out and, and uh, drive up premiums for those who remain. We've got to make sure that Medicare and the government has uh, the right and ability and is empowered to negotiate drug prices with these pharmaceutical companies just like the Veterans Administration does to bring down drug prices for both uh, consumers and taxpayers alike. And we've got to make sure that we have a Medicare system that every American, regardless of their age, can buy into at rates that are affordable based on their income. You're going to hear much of the same answers up here, but I'm the only candidate in this race who has a legislator has actually expanded coverage and I did it as House Democratic leader to 650,000 Michiganders through Medicaid expansion. I'll do the same in Congress. Thank you, Mr. Gravel. Ms. Saad. The first thing, frankly, that we need to do is we need to change the debate around health care in this country. And we have to talk about health care as nothing else but a right. Because until we elect leaders who are going to Washington and are going to talk about it only in that way, we've, we're never going to see reform. But I certainly agree that we need Medicare for all. We need to protect the ACA. 76,000 people in District 11 alone were able to gain access to health care because of what the ACA did. We need, to, we need to protect that and expand that. We can do that over the course of four or five years by slowly expanding access on age limits to Medicare so that we can slowly adjust and tweak the system as we go and keep up with costs. Furthermore, getting to a place of Medicare for all cuts costs. We spend $467 billion a year on administrative costs for health care alone, $116 billion on not being able to negotiate drug prices. This is how we're going to pay for it. Um, and so. It, they keep saying, oh, you want that, so how are you going to pay for it? Well, we've got to talk about what it's costing us not to have it. Thank you, Ms. Saad. Mr. Gupta. At a time when people in this district, people here, are making a weekly choice between the food they eat 
and the medicine they take because they can't afford both. Donald Trump wants to cut Medicare and Medicaid by two trillion dollars. I am the one candidate in this race with hands-on healthcare experience, working with real patients, real clinically trained providers, who has stood up to the prescription drug companies, and I'm gonna fight him every step of the way. I started a service for the past few years called RISE, and what we were doing is matching clinically trained providers with real patients to lower their risk for hypertension and diabetes. We ended up partnering with Michelle Obama's White House initiative. Now I will say, the person who helped me start this was my older brother, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Some of you know him. Uh, we both grew up on Harrison Street, right here in Livonia. Uh, and I will just tell you this for the record, I am still trying to make my mother proud. <laughs> He's already done enough to make 100 Indian mothers proud. <laughs> but we are gonna work hard to make sure that we, do, we get health care for all. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Um, I think this has to be our last question because I'm going to give you a little bit of extra time for this one um, and then we'll have to move on to closing statements. Um, so this is a question about tariffs. Uh, I'm going to combine two questions and we'll give them a minute and a half for this one. Do you agree with imposing punitive tariffs on our allies? Do you think a trade war will be beneficial for the U.S. economy? Do you see a recession influenced by the trade war looming in the near future? And we're going to start with Ms. Skinner. I can repeat that if you want me to. Please. Okay. Um, do you agree <clears throat> with imposing punitive tariffs on our allies? Will a trade war be beneficial for the U U.S. economy? Do you see a recession influenced by the trade war looming in the near future? Ms. Skinner. Well, one of the benefits of being old and <laughs> having been around, I was on um, a political talk show, I was nationally syndicated and television, debating O'Reilly and every network, MSNBC, CNN, they're the opposition. Is that I, I opposed NAFTA and, and CAFTA back in 93 against Bill Clinton. Because the reason that trade became so imbalanced is you had two billion Chinese willing to work for nothing, for cents on the dollar. And that didn't make sense because it wasn't a level playing field. So that's how those trade surp surp uh, 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 surpluses went wrong. That's where it went wrong, and a lot of manufacturing jobs went over there. But now what Trump is doing, and this isn't the way to write it, by engaging in uh, what kind of war is beneficial. I mean, when we're at war with Canada, we're in trouble. Okay, so this is a problem, and the EU and the rest of the world. Now are all, they're all making their own bilateral deals together without us. Disengaging from U.S. leadership is the wrong way to go. What we need to be doing is investing in massive infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, to create jobs and trade and re-engage with the rest of the world. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. Uh, yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to start yet or not. Um, That's okay. So, I was uh, confused about the time. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, there's, there's no question that the trade imbalance is a very serious problem. There's no question that America faces uh, very unfair trade policies by a number of countries around the world. So I certainly agree with the stated goal of negotiating better trade deals that better serve American interests and American workers. What I disagree with is the way Trump is going about it. Uh, as usual, Trump is going about this in a reckless way where he's uh, letting his mouth get ahead of his brain. And he is engaging in very dangerous brinksmanship. Yes, we do need higher labor standards around the world. Yes, we do need better protections for intellectual property around the world. Yes, we do need to make sure uh, that we're not allowing the dumping of steel uh, and other products into the United States. And yes, we need to put an end to currency manipulation by countries like Japan and China. But we would be much better off and we'd be much more successful in accomplishing those goals if instead of attacking and alienating our allies, we worked with our allies to single out and alienate those countries that are the worst perpetrators of these problems. If we join forces with our allies, we could put real pressure on China for real change that serves the interests of American workers. Thank you, Mr. Grimal. Ms. Saad. Bad trade deals is what has really District 11 in Michigan has certainly been reeling from for, for many, many years. And so we do need to continue to 
look at kind of what is affecting our economy, what kind of deals we're getting into with our allies, with other countries, and how that's affecting those people here at home. Currently, the Trump administration's um, tariffs and everything that he's engaged is hurting our economy, is hurting our suppliers to the automotive industry, to our manufacturing industry. We're not benefiting from them. And frankly, again, as, as Tim just said, I mean, in the way he's going about it and the way he's engaging our allies and really um, no longer engaging in diplomacy with people that we've had a really good relationship for years. It, we're in a world in which we're enemies with Canada and friends with North Korea. I, I, I just don't even understand the world that we're living in right now. Um, and we really need to, we need to continue to negotiate with our partners, with our allies, and continue to hold China accountable for their practices and what they're doing that's affecting our economy and ensure that we are continuing to, um, we're, we're continuing to protect our intellectual property here at home as well. Thank you, Ms. Saad. Mr. Gupta. Our campaign has now knocked on thousands of doors, and we, we, we hear a very common story, and again, it, it doesn't matter if you're Democratic, Independent, Republican, uh, people feel like they're working longer, harder, more productive hours than ever before, and having less to show for it. Meanwhile, the cost of prescription drugs, the cost of higher education continue to rise, and so people are feeling squeezed in a way that they've never felt squeezed before, and, and I know what that feels like. And both of my parents worked in the auto industry for over 30 years, and then in a single day, just like that, they both lost their jobs. And they were both in their late 50s, and I know that a lot of people in this room know what that feels like because this region lost 700,000 jobs during that time. It was during that time that I realized that I was going to go out there and I was going to go create good paying jobs. The kinds of jobs that let you take care of yourself and the people you love. The kinds of jobs that I want to create here so that our kids have jobs waiting for them when they finish their schooling. I'm going to go anywhere and do anything to create good paying jobs here in the district and I will fight any Congress or any President that wants to create incentives for companies to ship jobs overseas. Instead, I'll be working to create incentives to, to create jobs here. And we can't talk about all of this and trade and jobs without talking about education. I will say this, the best thing that we can do for our schools, the best thing we can do for our kids is to get rid of Betsy DeVos. <laughs> you what, I, I wouldn't uh, trust Donald Trump to make his way out of a paper bag, let alone sign an executive order that renegotiates trade deals for us. What the president has done has been entirely reckless, and it has been unstable for many. And I certainly have a lot of disagreements with the approach. I know firsthand because I worked as chief of staff to the president, President Obama's senior counselor for manufacturing policy, and we looked at these issues front hand. Holding China accountable, currency manipulation, the illegal dumping, cybersecurity, the, the securitization of our supply chain. These are the things that we need to be focusing on, not issuing flippant executive orders. So what can Congress do? Well, first, let, let's start with uh, you know not passing tax packages that, that will put us into a recession because the current tax package that was passed at the end of last year, that tax package is going to increase our deficit by 1.5 trillion over the next 10 years. So for all of you in this room who have got your sleeves rolled up, you're talking to voters, I want you to be really clear with people. People who say to you, I'm socially liberal but fiscally conservative, welcome them into our party and tell them that there are people who are willing to work for them and to make our government work again for people and businesses. That's what we need to be focused on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Uh, that concludes the question portion of this forum. We will now let the candidates make a one-minute closing statement. We're going in reverse order of opening statements, so we'll start with Mr. Gupta. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me here. You know, at, at these forums, and we've had a few of these now, and I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, if you're anything like my wife back there, you're thinking to yourself, I, we're kind of hearing sort of the same answers over and over again. Um, and you know, I think at these forums, we talk a lot about these issues. Um, but at its heart, I think now people are really wondering about who we are, our character, what kind of person they want to send to Washington, uh, and how we're different from each other. I will tell you that I am the candidate in this race with real hands-on healthcare experience. 
I'm the candidate in this race who has created good paying jobs. I'm the candidate in this race with a science and technology background. And I'm also the son of a bold, brave woman and the father of two little girls, and I will not be someone who brushes things under the rug. I'm going to stand with you to change the tone in Washington. I'm going to stand up for everyday people, and I'm going to help you take this country back from Donald Trump. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Ms. Saad. I'm, I'm the daughter of immigrants. My parents came here from Lebanon over 40 years ago. They started a small family business that still exists in Detroit's Eastern Market. It's a meat wholesale business. That business has gone on to create a number of other businesses, create many jobs in and around the district. Um, and I learned from my parents what it means to work hard to come here with very little and to just grind and hustle and get things done. And frankly, they came here very simply in search of the American dream. And they found that here. And so I've had a career in public service because I wanted to protect that American dream. I'm the only person who's worked at the state, local, and federal level. I've worked on building and helping pass legislation gone to D.C. to understand how Washington works, how to navigate that environment, and then brought it back here to Michigan, working for Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan, and really understanding how those policies and programs that we're creating at the state and national level are affecting people on the ground and what we need to do to get change and bring, bring, bring people what they need. Thank you, Ms. Saad. Mr. Grimal. <laughs> You're not going to see a lot of differences between where we are on policy. As you can tell, most of us agree on most of the policy issues. The main distinction between us is that I have spent my entire adult life here in Southeast Michigan being civically involved and fighting for progressive social justice policies. I'm the only candidate in this race who's ever won an election. I'm the only candidate in this race who's ever held elected office. As the House Democratic leader in the Michigan legislature, I fought Republicans and won an increase in the minimum wage and won an expansion of Medicaid coverage to cover 650,000 previously uninsured Michiganders. And only by uh, electing people with a proven track record of delivering results and getting things done will we make sure that we renew the American dream restore American values, and ensure that every single American, regardless of their background, their race, their gender, or their sexual orientation, have a real opportunity to succeed and achieve the American middle class dream. Thank you, Mr. Grimal. Ms. Skinner. Well, we do agree a lot on policy mostly, but um, I think one thing you can agree with is I will not be a shy freshman congresswoman working for you. This is not the time to be shy. My persistence over four elections, it's persistence that got uh, the slaves freed. It, was, it took eight years to give women the right to vote. Climate change is the biggest issue of our time and it's the biggest solution to all our economic problems. The Great Lakes are in danger right now if Enbridge uh, Line 5 is not completely removed. These things require strong voices People who know how to, who've been in this political game for many, many years and know how to go up against the competition. There are a lot of people who've had a lot of experience and they've gone there and nothing has been done. And Democrats, let's face it, we're like Charlie Brown with the football here in Michigan. A lot of times we've been snookered and nothing is happening. It's happening in Washington. So if you want to send someone who has courage and persistence and isn't shy, and uh, thank you, Dad, that's from the persistence of my father who was never shy and said, never give up. I'm your candidate. I, I'm asking for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. Ms. Stevens. I'm Haley Stevens, and I'm asking for your vote in the Democratic nomination for Congress in Michigan's 11th District. The question here tonight is, what does it mean to be a Democrat? What is our party all about? And I will tell you this. We are the party of people. We are the party, and i got to stand up, because I've been ducking behind you guys all night, and you matter to me, because that is my message, that you matter to me, that your access to affordable health care matters to me, that your access to affordable higher education matters, that inclusion matters, 
that our environment matters. And that is what we need to put a premium on. I served as chief of staff on President Obama's U.S. auto rescue. I am running to send the next generation of firebrand leadership to our United States Congress to deliver for our state, to deliver for you, your families, and your grandchildren. And I would be so honored to have your vote. And I am deeply honored to stand up here tonight with all of my colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Well, I'd like to thank all of the candidates who participated in tonight's forum for the 11th District House of Representatives, both the Democratic candidates and the Republican candidates. Uh, remember that as a voter, you must choose either a Republican or a Democratic ballot for the primary. And as I've been told tonight by a precinct worker, you can now choose a Libertarian ballot. So that is a recognized uh, party that you can choose that ballot. The winner of the Democratic, Republican, and Libertarian primaries will face up against each other and other third party and write-in candidates in November. In the November election, a voter is free to vote for any candidate he or she chooses. They do not have to be in the same party. I want to thank the city of Livonia for allowing us to use their facility for the forum tonight. Our forum has been videotaped and can be viewed in a few days on the websites of the League of Women Voters Northwest Wayne County and the League of Women Voters Oakland area. I want to thank the candidates for their willingness to serve the public and for the audience for your great questions tonight. All of the primary candidates were also invited to participate in the League of Women Voters Voter Guide. This is a publication that you can access online on our websites and also by visiting vote411.org. That's vote411.org. And those should be available, if not now, very soon. We urge voters to review the responses of the candidates on the voter guide before voting absentee or at the polls on election day on August 7th. Primary election day is August 7th. The polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. If you vote in person, you will be asked for a picture ID. If you don't have a picture ID or you don't have it with you, you can still vote by signing an affidavit of identity. Voting in a primary election is just as important as the voting in the general election. And we urge you all to be participants in our democracy by making educated choices in the primary election. That concludes our forum this evening. I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Thank you.